learning and teaching and what classroom and schools look like is evolving and changing. And we've kind of been able to stretch ourselves to the point uh, that as we visit with people um, across the country, uh, we think that we're probably now kind of on that or getting very near to that leading edge of what's happening across the country. Not because of anything we've necessarily done creatively, it's just that we've gone and visited and we've begged, borrowed, and stolen from everybody that we could and then try to manipulate that and work that to what could work in our context. And we've got a lot of people that have helped us do that over the last couple of years. So we've got a number of teachers and principals and counselors that have helped us kind of along the way. So we're going to hear from kids today about how their schools are changing. We're going to hear from teachers around how things are uh, changing and how things are looking a little bit different. And we'll hear very briefly from administrators, but we want to spend the most amount of time hearing from our students. So if our students can come on up uh, and have a seat at our panel. And so we're going to do uh, about 25 minutes with the students. We're going to do about 15 minutes with the teachers and about 10 minutes with our administrators and then have uh, time for questions. And our student panel is going to be moderated uh, by Dr. Kinoy, who is our principal at Rogers Elementary. Thank you, Dr. Gaines. I think what we'll do is I will start by asking the students a question. And if you could please, before you answer, if you could just introduce yourself and tell us where you're at. So Gabe Jackson. Gabe is a student at Mosaic Elementary School. And Gabe, if you could please talk to us a little bit about how learning is different at Mosaic from what you've experienced in your previous years at elementary with Gabe being a fourth grader at Mosaic. And then what excites you about being a student at Mosaic? Well, we use Chromebooks here more often at Mosaic. Um, so we can use uh, websites like Compass Learning and Front Row and um, it opens a new door of learning. And at my old school, I would just sometimes get bored in lessons. And uh, at Mosaic, it's part of the program to teach at different levels. And I think that's really cool to teach at different lessons in a school. And what excites me to be at Mosaic is because it's its first year in the making. And um, it's a big responsibility because we're the, uh, as fourth graders, we're the oldest ones and we're setting the tone for classes after us and the younger kids. Um, for example, my sister, uh, who is a kindergarten a kindergartner, um, they look up to us fourth graders as we adapt to this new model of learning. Very nice. And Gabe, if I could just follow up for a moment with a question. I know that your teacher might talk about that daily menu that you have. Could you just talk a little bit about that from a student perspective? Well, with our menu, uh, we have well, for math and ELA, uh, our reading block, we, for ELA, we um, have our menu to see how many minutes we read, how many compass lessons we, I mean, how many quizzes we do on compass, and our seesaw post. And with math, we have how many quizzes we do, how many fact practices we do, and how, and how many seesaw posts we do. Great. Thank you, Gabe. Thanks for an excellent description of Mosaic. I appreciate that. Now we'll go to Rachel Davis. Rachel, if you could just please tell us your grade level and what school you go to. Hi, I'm Rachel Davis, and I go to Oakville Middle School, and I'm in seventh grade. Wonderful. And so, Rachel, could you describe what kinds of STEAM experiences you have in the school day? Well, in my uh, social studies class, we learn about like how the Romans built the Colosseum and all the engineering part that they used. And in health class, we use like how to make things like and how to make our world better. And how do you think being part of STEAM has been different than your previous years at Oakville Middle? I think it just gives us an open door to learning so we can see like new jobs that we could do in our future. 
and being part of STEAM, has that made you think about jobs you might want in the future? And if so, what kind of jobs? Yes, I want to be an uh, x-ray physician because I've learned the main parts of it and it interests me a lot. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Nathan. Nathan, if you could tell us your, your grade and where you go to school. So uh, I'm Nathan Fetter. I go to Bernard Middle School, and I'm in eighth grade. And so Nathan, how has your exposure to PLTW, and if you could just tell us what that stands for, helped your learning in other classes? So PLTW is Project Lead the Way, which there are a bunch of different classes. They're all like engineering focused, and like they're a lot different than normal classes. And in PLTW, we solve a lot of uh, like problems ourselves with less help from teachers than in other classes. Everything is very hands-on, so we're always uh, working on the next thing. And we have to come up with the solutions to these problems ourselves, and everything feel, really feels like we've accomplished something when we do it. In a normal class, the teacher will teach us what to do and how to solve problems, but it, everything's not as hands-on, and a lot of times we're not going to be working on it. In PLTW, we find the solutions to problems and we're planning how to do stuff before we do do things. Everything is, um, there's many different ways to solve all the problems that we do. And this leads to, in other classes, being able to figure out how to do things like that we normally wouldn't be able to do and thinking before rushing ahead and trying to solve a problem. Everything also allows us to find the best way to solve a problem instead of just any way. And if I don't understand something, I can usually find the answer. This is all made given a positive impact on my classes and lets me find better solutions more effectively. Also allows me to uh, think about new problems in different ways and has made learning faster, easier, and given me new ideas on how to figure problems out. Well, it sounds like it's given you a lot of things to think about in yeah. these classes, and you mentioned a number of times about coming up with solutions to problems on your own as a student yeah. as compared to the teacher giving those to you. Do you have a specific example of something that you have worked on this year where you've taken on a challenge of a problem and coming up with a solution? Yeah, so this year we've had different apps that I've been creating in uh, MIT App Inventor and a lot of times in the apps we'll be given like requirements, what the app needs to do, and then we'll have to figure out how the app is going to be able to do that. Nice. So you've created an app? Yeah. And what does that one do? Uh, so far, um, since we're just in like the beginning, the apps we've created have just like been like diagrams for like the body and then we've also done like a little game where you like have to fight a germ. Sounds like fun. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now let's go on to some of our high school students. Rachel, if you could and by the way, Rachel was in the AP quiz before coming here, so thank you very much for finishing that early. Tell us a little bit about uh, what grade you are and the program that you are in, and what um, your day is like okay. in that program. I am a senior here at Melville, and um, so I've actually gotten to experience two of our newer um, programs this year. Last semester, I did um, our MyPath program, which basically allowed me to be able to create my own um, class and so I got to experience new things and even if I needed to I could leave school if like I needed to do so I started out doing forensic psychology and then I just went to like forensic so if I needed to do a lab or anything at like a college that I could have gotten a program through um, I could leave school and basically just do my own thing and then uh, I ended up actually studying music at the end of the semester which led into this semester where uh, because of our A and B days, I'm actually allowed to, I take two classes at Merrimack first off, and then so that allows me to take time off of high school. So on A days, I actually only come for three days, or three classes, and then I leave at the end of the day to allow me time to get ready for my nighttime classes and do my homework and just do whatever I need to do in order to prepare for other things in my life. And then on B days, I am more than welcome to come to school. <laughs> but I don't have to. Um, since I work on my, like, my college stuff at home typically because it, I take one online class and then one class on Tuesday nights for it's three hours long and um, both of the classes regards music and so I'm studying that. So basically being um, 
or being able to not come to high school and being able to focus on other things as well has allowed me to really pursue my music career. And um, so basically being in this like early college start program has let me get a hold on what I want to do and so it allows me more time to do that. So Rachel, I just want to follow up a little bit with a, a question or two. Why is it that you decided to go this route of early college? Like, was this something you thought about as soon as you entered high school, or how did this whole notion come to you of pursuing this path? Um, well, I've always taken like AP classes and honors classes, and so taking a lot of those through the high school just kind of led me to going into the college classes early, just because I have been ahead this entire time. So it just kind of allows me to be even more ahead. So. And how does it feel to be a high school student walking around a college campus? A little scary, <laughs> but it's fun, it's nice. It's fun. And do you think those AP classes, how are those compared to your college classes? Um, they're pretty similar, so they do a really good job here on keeping you up to date with how college classes are going to be later in life. So they've really helped. Great, thank you. Sabrina, if you could tell us where you go to school and then what grade you're in, and then I'll start with my questions. Um, so I'm Sabrina Leach and I'm a senior at Oakville High School. And so Sabrina, you are here representing my path, and so I have a few questions for you. How has my path opened up new learning opportunities for you, and how do you feel this will impact your future? Um, so with my path, it's it's very much different than like all the other courses I'm taking. So um, like I'm driving my own studies as opposed to like basically the rest of like my schooling. It's always been like I basically do whatever the teacher is telling me to do. But with this, I'm creating my own lesson plan, and with that. Um, it's really allowed me the freedom to like investigate whatever I'm interested in. Like my my path is on sustainability, so um, I can attack that issue in whatever way that I want to. Um, I really like learning, I guess, through projects. So I make my my path very project based, um, and then with that, it it's allowed me to investigate not only like my interests, but how I learn and how I like to learn. Um, and then also, like I said, with how. Um, I'm leading my own studies. Um, it's really helped to build up my motivation and then um, it's just tested my confidence and my like responsibility to get things done and accomplish my goals, which um, is I think going to be universally applicable in the future. Um, and then with being able to like figure out what my interest is and what I'm passionate about now before I go into college, like that's going to be also extremely helpful so that way when I'm in college I know what classes I want to take and like even after I graduate I know I'm going into a career that I'll be like satisfied with. And I, I watched a little video that you were in where you talked about your project with sustainability. How did that whole project come to be? Um, so my idea for my path actually um, started out with my gold award for Girl Scouts. So. Um, at the time I was hearing about my path, I was figuring out what I wanted to do for my gold award, which that's like, it's like the Eagle Scout of Girl Scouts. Um, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and I realized that with like all my obligations, I didn't think I was going to have enough time to like do it to the extent that I wanted to. Um, so with this, it gave me like the perfect opportunity to um, not only complete my gold award, but expand what I was looking into. Um, and so like, I actually just completed my gold award um, thanks to my path, but it's allowed me to not only just do that, which is very much um, doing projects out in the community, but um, I also have the time to learn about sustainability more and like um, just for myself, so that way when I'm in college, I know like the basic issues and like how to approach different problems for that. And so, if a student came to you and said, "Hey," I'm thinking about choosing to go this my path route. What would you tell them? Um, I would definitely say that they should do it. Um, it's definitely not a blow off class. Um, some people think that you know it's an independent study. You can just go home and sleep, but that's not the case. And um, I can say like everyone that's in my path that I've seen, like they're putting in just as much time I think as an AP course, um, but like it's on their own. And I don't think it feels like as much work because. 
like it's something we're passionate about and like I said you can attack whatever you want to study in however way you want to um, so it's like in a way you like learning too. And so what do you think are some of the skills that you're going to take away from this program that will either help you in college or beyond? Um, so having I guess a couple of completed projects under my belt is really going to help with my confidence and my leadership skills along with communicating with people on how I want to get stuff done. Um, so like one thing I could do in college is I could be an ambassador for the sustainability department at my college campus. Um, and with this I've already done some projects and I've helped implement that, implement that into parts of the community. So when I go to college I'll have that experience um, like overcoming those different like obstacles that you don't really see in the traditional like school projects a department when it comes to like working with people and just like those little details where I have to figure out that by myself. Um, so just those like little things I think is what I'm going to be taking with me the most. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks. So young man who I've heard a lot about this morning already compliments of Mr. Wolf. If you could please introduce yourself. Uh, what program you participate in, your, your grade level, and then I'll start asking. Sure. Um, my name is Aiden Cresswell. I'm a senior here at Melville. Um, I'm here representing St. Louis CAPS. CAPS stands for Centers of Advanced Professional Studies. Um, basically what we do is um, we learn the basis of soft skills and professionalism, and then we're given the opportunities to work um, towards internships and post-secondary opportunities in the future. So it's a program that's very much you get what you put into it. And for me, it helped um, with time management a lot. So, and so describe first, please, like how long you've been in the program, uh, if you could describe the program in some detail as well, and then how it has helped you learn more about what you want to do in the future. Sure. Um, I've been in the program since the beginning of the school year. I applied during the summer. Um, around August maybe. Um, some of the things we do in the program, we work with real businesses, um, with real problems that they face. Like I am currently working with getting an internship with the Veterans Business Resource Center and what they do is they help veterans start small businesses if they so choose to after serving in the military. Um, we've worked with the Afton Chamber of Commerce. Um, we've planned events for them. We've planned our own events. I've actually been a project manager for some of our events. Um, we've worked with the Lee May Development Committee on finding ways to get people outside and to redevelop the stretch of Lee May in between like Bayless and River de Pere. Um, We've worked with people from um, Merits, MetLife, um, independent entrepreneurs, State Farm, just a whole bunch of people. Um, just recently, actually, we were we met with a local business owner. She is the franchise owner of the St. Louis Surge, which is a women's basketball team here in St. Louis. So, and it's helped me learn what I don't want to do by giving me a bunch of opportunities and seeing what I don't like and what I do like. Um, originally, I, I thought I wanted to go into computer programming. That didn't shake well. And then I thought I maybe wanted to do business administration, but that was too much on the business side. So I like to have a mix of working with businesses and working with people. So I'm going to end up going into human resources. And they helped me kind of weed through all those opportunities that I have to find something that I really am passionate about. And so you said this is your first year in the program? Yes. This is the first year that I've been in the program. It's open for juniors and seniors and it's currently three years old. It started two years ago with just health care. There's two other strands. Um, I'm in the business strand and there's also an engineering strand. We're hoping to expand to technological solutions like IT. We actually have businesses like Oasis and a woman who runs like a programming boot camp already on board to help us with that. So it's looking pretty good. 
And I'd like to just follow up with one last question. So you spent your first three years as a student in what some might say is a traditional high school setting. How has this experience been different than those previous three years? Um, I would say nine day, almost. Um, I learned a lot of things here, um, but being able to take the things I've learned here, then use them in a practical sense, and then get things that I probably get skills that I probably wouldn't get until maybe my first or second year in college now gives me that leg up um, ahead of my contemporaries. And so that helps a lot because then my resume looks a lot better and then I become better as a person because I'm able to speak with people and actually relate and communicate and convey an important message. Great. Sounds like you've learned a lot. And didn't you also mention, too, that you joined the military as well? I did. I do a lot of things. Um, I don't sleep much, but that's not important. Um, I'm in four clubs. I am a member of Stuco, senior exec. Um, we are Melville, which is like a super club here. And I'm the team captain of our boys track team. Um, I am in the National Guard. Um, I'll be going away a month after graduation for basic training. <laughs> um, and I do accounting here and math, and I have pretty much a f more than full workload, but since I have learned adequate time management, um, it doesn't really stress me out or bother me. I get everything that I need to get done finished. Great, thank you. And Jordan, if you could please introduce yourself, where you go to school and what program you participate in. Hello, my name is Jordan Patterson. I go to Oakville and South Tech High School, and South Tech is what I'll be talking about today. And so, speaking of South Tech, could you just talk a little bit about that program, and then how you believe this program will affect your future, Jordan? Definitely. I am in the automotive pro program at South Tech, and South Tech has already opened many doors for me and all of my fellow classmates. I mean, we have they've opened career doors and doors to continue our future. Our, uh, our field at South Tech really needs, I mean, everybody needs more automotives. We all drove here, well, maybe not all of us, but we all had some transportation here, and, you know, the field is growing for more people. And South Tech has already had many events, like we had an NH, uh, I want to say, yeah, NHRA event, where we went to a racetrack, and there were many dealers and brands of cars like Chevrolet, Dodge, Ford, um, Subaru was there also where we could sit down, talk with all these people, and we could also get our foot in the door to a job after maybe high school or if we go to college. Um, we've had Valvoline come talk to us. We've already had opportunities to apply there. I've actually got some friends that are uh, working for Valvoline right now. I mean, they're juniors. They're not even 18 yet. And um, I also have a friend, uh, Joe, who also is in the program with me. And um, they've had a small business that has actually had asked the teachers, hey, we need people. Would you come and work for us? And I mean, it's just crazy how many doors are opening for us. I mean, we've had opportunities to go to Rankin and Shadow and uh, Tech. We've had opportunities to learn about Lynn Tech and other technical high schools all around that will further our careers. I mean, we could do so much. I mean, they've taught so much about how to put your foot in the door. You know, they've already got, they're, they just keep telling you, pushing you to, hey, do this and it'll help you in the future. They also pushed us to join Skills USA, which, just, which I did join. And I've already got about another thousand, two thousand dollars knocked off my college because of that. Five dollars, two thousand. That sounds really impressive. And you know, you talk a, a bit about opening doors on account of this program. So, where do you see yourself in the future on account of participating in this program? So, as I said, how Valvoline came, and we could have applied there. I could have, if for the not for not the fact that I already have two jobs. But, um, I mean, I can see myself easily after South Tech, either I want to go to Rankin or Lynn Tech. I want to go to a college that will be able to further my career and get deeper into it. Some of my friends may think otherwise, though. They might want to 
go ahead and be a lube technician and go ahead and change tires and everything, which is great, but I want to own my own shop. And I've already got doors open to where I can talk to people, possible investors or possible people who can help me and teach me how to do that. Well, that's wonderful. And I would like to commend each and every one of you because you certainly represented yourself well, your programs well, and the Melville School District very well. So I appreciate you uh, being here today and speaking so eloquently about what you are doing because you are certainly making an impact not only on your life, but also being a positive agent of change. And I really appreciate that very much. So last night, our Board of Education approved what we're calling our portrait of a graduate. Uh, and that, those are kind of the skills and attributes that we'd like to see our students have when they walk across the stage at graduation. So just really quickly, those are around being a good communicator, being uh, creative and being a critical thinker, being ethical and a global citizen, students being persistent and self-aware. So you can see those traits already coming through in the students that you just heard from. And we're so very proud of what they've been doing. So our next group is kind of a the group of teachers who are helping make um, a lot of this happen. So if we could get our teacher panel uh, to come on up and uh, Mrs. Kellerman, who's our principal at Oakville High School, will be moderating this group. Uh, our teacher panel are a group of educators and a counselor who uh, have really come to full circle in terms of what we are offering our students and they are a part of what these kids that you just talked about, they're part of, of that success as well. So again, just like the kids, uh, would you please uh, just say who you are and what school you are from uh, and then we'll answer the question. So I'm going to start with uh, Lauren Widmer. So there you go. Uh, my name is Lauren Widmer. I am the personalized learning lab teacher and my path mentor at Oakville High School. So Lauren, your role is very different at the high school. So how do you balance the students in the personalized learning lab as well as the students that are in my path? Those are kind of your responsibilities at our school. Sure. So I normally say that the best way that I can prepare for my day is to be well rested, well caffeinated, and ready for anything, <laughs> which is really an oversimplified way to say that um, both programs are really student driven. In a traditional classroom, I think the instruction is really teacher oriented, uh, but in both of the programs, the students really drive the learning. So with the personalized learning lab, students are engaged in mastery learning through a blended online program and traditional classroom instruction, which is where I come in and offer remediation when they need help. Um, and the MyPath students, as you heard from Sabrina, really drive everything in their own learning. So for me, it's more of maintaining an educational atmosphere and keeping an eye on my students doing the blended learning and making sure that they get assistance when they need it. Um, and then with the MyPath students being there as more of a mentor and making sure that they are setting goals for themselves that are really gonna push what they are capable of while addressing their own passions for learning. Um, and then being there as a person to kind of bounce ideas off of and make sure that they feel comfortable changing in the direction that they're going um, and really just offering support and resources if they need um, to make sure that they are getting to where they want to be. Okay, great. So we're going to go to Sarah. Would you please tell us who you are and what school you're with? Absolutely. My name is Sarah Bradley and I'm a fourth grade teacher at Mosaic Elementary. So you've had a much different year this year than you have in the past. Certainly. And the teachers at Mosaic use a menu, and they talked a little bit about that, the student did. So can you describe what that looks like during the day for you as a teacher, from a teacher perspective? Absolutely. So I want you to imagine for a moment your elementary classroom. Probably you walked in and the desks were in rows, or maybe if your teacher was really innovative, they were in pods and every student was doing the same thing at the same time, learning the exact same lesson. Mosaic looks really different. Um, students aren't sitting in desks. They aren't sitting in neat rows or pods. They have a flexible environment. Along with that goes our menu. Our menu empowers students to guide their own learning. With our menu, we have what we call our meals. Those are things that we expect students to accomplish throughout the week at their own path and their own pace. 
We also have what are called our desserts, which give students an opportunity to explore things that they're interested in learning, their passions. Um, it empowers students to drive their own learning, to also prioritize their learning, which helps develop some of those soft skills that they're going to need as they move on to uh, middle school and high school and then into their future careers. Okay, great. As a, one other question. So as a teacher, how do you, as an educator, compare what you've done in the past to what you're doing now? What we're doing now is a lot more student driven. Um, our students are a lot more empowered to um, drive their own learning <laughs> and so rather than having every student do the same thing on the same day at the same time, we are meeting the students individual needs. Um, we, we use a lot, our instruction is all data driven. So we look at not only the data, where they are individually, but we also look at their passions as well. And we try to integrate both of those things into their day, into their menu. Whereas before, I would have been teaching the same lesson to the same students at the same time, regardless of where they were at an academic level and their passion. OK, thanks. All right, so Hannah. Um, all our middle schools have had some big changes this year. Um, can you tell us uh, what school you're at? Yes, um, I'm a sixth grade ELA teacher over at Oakville Middle School. Okay, and I think that this is the surprising one because you are a STEM innovator in the STEM innovator program, but you're an English teacher. Yes. And of course we all think of STEM as science and math. Um, so how has your classroom changed from the past compared to now? Um, it has done a complete 180. I will tell you how has it not changed. Um, through the STEM Innovator training, I've learned that STEM is a lot more than just the words that it stands for. Um, it's really more about the soft skills, it's the four C's, the critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication, which is where the ELA piece fits in. And with the STEM coach that has been working with us, um, I have developed a STEM project, I like to call Agents of Change, um, just one of the projects that I do. And it's giving the students a combination of these um, soft skills that they're going to need in the future career. And it combines um, the STEM skills, the ELA skills, and it gives them an authentic real world scenario where the kids um, have a purpose for the projects that they do. Um, the number one change in my classroom that I've seen is student engagement. They're no longer just sitting at their desks reading or writing. They are active participants in their learning. Um, very similar to what some of these other teachers have said, it's very student driven. They are the ones that are picking the questions, what they want to research and investigate. Um, they are the ones who are really participating in what I like to call kind of a learning lab and giving them the, that authentic experience and connecting it to real world careers, now the students understand why they're learning the skills they're learning and, and they are more invested in taking ownership of what they're doing in class. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I never know what my classroom is going to look like. Um, sometimes we have students up calling or emailing or interviewing experts from the local community. They come into our classroom, they collaborate with students to work on these projects that solve real-world real world problems here in our community. Um, sometimes I have groups of students who are down the library using technology like iMovie, the green screen, to create um, advertisements for their campaigns, for their projects they've designed. Um, we use the engineering design process, so even though students might not necessarily be building items, they are actually building and designing their own projects. So it's all student created, and my role has really changed from instead of being up talking in front of the class, I am now more of a coach, I'm more of a facilitator. I'm there for the students saying, how can I help you complete your project and make this a vision. And all of the projects that the students do with STEM, um, they have to have some ideas and designs and the biggest change is, is having them understand the mindset that it's okay to fail and that troubleshooting and problem solving is going to be part of the process. And being there just to kind of encourage them along the way and say, well, it's okay. What's your plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E? Let's just keep going. Um, and also with present, presenting different projects that the students do, um, not necessarily giving them directions of an end result saying this is the one way that you have to do this, this is the, this is the one project of what it's supposed to look like, 
letting students explore different ways to create and show their learning. And they ask, well, can I do it this way? Well, I don't know, can you? Uh, you know, what can I do to help you make that possible? And so that's kind of the biggest changes I've seen is I've had to step back from the front of the classroom and really putting the students in the driver's seat. And, um, you know, with, with STEM, it's more than just the careers. It's more than just the words. It's really about those soft skills, the 21st century learning, working together. And it's um, the biggest change for me is really just myself. It's the culture of my classroom, of being a safe place to take risks and not being afraid to fail. And um, it's a change that I'm really glad I made. So thank you. Great. <laughs> That's a very good description of an innovator. Um, and we're kind of excited we're going to start at the high school as well. Um, so, Kristen. You have been teaching science in a very traditional for a little while. Yes. We had physics first, and now we are a PLTW person. So can you uh, tell us where you are and what you do? Yeah, my name is Kristen Wheatley, and I'm here at Melville High School. I am a science teacher as well as the Project Lead the Way Chair here in the building. Um, so traditionally, like Jane said, my science class has been lecture, lab, group work, test. Um, that's how I learned best, so that's how I started teaching, of course, because I learned with what I'm comfortable with. Um, but then uh, when we started advising our kids here at Melville High School and what they wanted to take, we started seeing um, people shy away from the Project Lead the Way classes in engineering, typically just because the stigma was that they were hard. What we learned is that they were hard in the reason that they had to defend their learning for the engineering classes, and that was something that they knew when they signed up they had to do, and like I'm sure that other teachers along the way made them defend their learning, but they knew almost every lesson that they had to do in a Project Lead the Way class made them defend what they were learning and how they learned it. So when we were presented with starting a biomed trend in 2012, a couple of us jumped on board and were pretty excited. And after we went to the training in RALA and learned what the pedagogy was and how to put that in place, we have five um, biology teachers here in the building that have gone through the training for PLTW. And now all of us have changed the way we teach our regular biology classes because we saw how it made the kids really um, take ownership for their learning and really internalize their learning as opposed to just learning the facts, putting them on a test, and then moving on. So it's really changed a little bit and now with um, the state moving towards a different type of end of course success, our assessment for us with more modeling, we think that PLTW is a great fit for that. Um, I know when Nathan talked up here a little bit earlier, I was like, oh, he just answered my question for me, so that was really great. But I'm super excited that we put PLTW down in the middle school because now they're going to have that experience as early as sixth grade because as a high school teacher, when you're trying to change the way that they've been taught from kindergarten all the way up, it's, it's very hard. We saw that first with physics first. We see it with PLTW now that we're trying to change them to think of, open up the box. What can you do? What's different? What is different than anything that you've done before? Um, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit challenging for them. But um, now that I've seen the engineering piece in action, and we just added the computer science piece a couple of years ago, I think they're going to be well-rounded kids. And the best part about that is if they complete the entire program, we have a capstone class, which exactly what Hannah says, it's bringing back all of the other skills that they've learned. They have a semester long project where they have to figure out what it is that they want to be passionate about and they have to present it to not only people in the building but other mentors that they go out and they get um, as well as some of the other people in the district. So it's been awesome. Thank you. Amanda. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Amanda Barton, and I teach fifth grade at Beasley Elementary. Okay, so continuous classroom improvement, CCI, is based on the Ball Ridge Quality Improvement Framework. Can you talk about how your students track their own progress in the classroom and any benefits that you as an educator see from that? Yes. Um, students, um, with using CCI in my classroom, students are allowed to track their own progress in many different ways. Um, it really focuses on goal setting, and they then make a plan moving forward on what strategies they will use in order to meet that goal, and then they, we discuss and analyze their results and make a plan moving forward. Um, and then we set class goals as well as individual goals. Um, at the beginning of the year, we set a class goal for our, we give a Mastery Connect bench, benchmark assessment each term. And as a class, um, we discuss those results each term. And at the beginning, we set a goal that every student would be meeting expectations by the end of the year. So I have that displayed in my room anonymously, a bar graph on how many students are getting the score, the score, and the score, one, two, or three. And as the year progresses, we hope to see the green bar, the three bar grow and grow and grow. 
Um, and then we also uh, do two-week learning cycles, and we've been focusing on multiplication and division fact fluency. And so um, each week, I share the class average with the students on what they're getting on their uh, weekly tests. In a minute, they do as many as they can out of 20. And so each week, we're hoping to see that, av that class average grow. And every two weeks, we have a class meeting and discuss um, where they want to go moving forward, if they got there, what worked this week, what didn't work, what strate strategies did you use. We try to come up with a bank of strategies that are best practices moving forward. And um, if the goal is met, we try to have a small celebration. And if it is not met, we discuss maybe why it wasn't met and how we could change that moving forward. Um, and then as individual, they each have an individual um, data folder and they collect their weekly math fluency tests. They have a data table and they collect their scores. And they also make a plan for the next week, or they set a goal for the next week on what they would like to get, what score, and also a plan for how they plan to meet that goal. And we talk about um, setting attainable goals. You know, so your neighbor's goal might not look the same as yours, and that's okay. We're all learning differently. Um, it really helps us differentiate. Um, it helps the kids focus on their individual growth, and maybe they're not, you know, yet at a fifth grade level. But if they're making growth, that's what we care about. That's what's important. They're learning. Um, so they track their fluency scores. They track their benchmark data scores, and they make individual plans on what they want to, um, how they want to perform on the next benchmark. Um, they also track their daily attendance in their individual data folders in case maybe we see a common uh, theme, maybe a student is missing all the time on a Friday. If that's the case, maybe we need to have a one-on-one -on -one and discuss why that's happening and how we can maybe fix that. And then they also track their individual reading levels um, each term. And with doing this, it's just, it's so nice for the students. They really have taken ownership in their learning. It's proven to be very motivating. And it's just so cool to see the excitement on their face when they see that they're learning. And really, that's what teaching is all about, so. Thank you. And finally, Steve. Tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're located. Uh, my name is Steve King. I'm the um, department chair at Oakville High School, as well as a college and career counselor. OK, so Steve, you've been in the district uh, for 16 years, of 17. 17, you came with me. Um, so. How has things evolved as a counselor, as the school, from the time that you started working with students at Oakville to what we do now? Um, amazing leaps and bounds changes. Um, as you can hear from the, from the students as well as, as our staff here, um, there's just so many more opportunities for students. Not everybody learns the same. We certainly have um, the curriculum at the high school, which is very solid probably second to none um, around all of the high schools in the area, and I truly believe that. Um, and that's a traditional setting with, with AP courses, college courses, certainly an increase in that, as well as additional opportunities such as dual enrollment, um, the dual credit has exploded, uh, which is earning college credit while they're in high school. Um, but really we're focusing on careers and you really need to focus on the careers before you start looking for colleges. You have to know what type of job you want to have and, and that process of finding out about the job. Is that job for you? Is it a growing market? What you can make uh, in that field? And once you have an idea, then you start looking for your education. Um, earlier in, in my career, it was theory. You know, we, we took interest inventories. We talked about careers. Um, you tried to match that. We're now, and just here recently, we've been given more tools for our toolbox. Not everybody learns the same. We want to know, ideally, we want to prepare kids for the future and their jobs. So that looks different for everybody. With giving them the experiences, like with my path, um, with CAPS, you're able to try on real world experiences in careers. Is this for you or not? Regardless of the outcome, if the student takes the risk and, and does something different than what everybody else is doing, uh, which is not bad, of course, but if, if they are highly motivated. As Sabrina has mentioned, there's a lot of work there, but you're creating the work. And when you create the work, it's not so bad. 
However, what we want to do is to see what type of career is for you, what type of field that you would like to go into, trying it on. Because if you just, in theory, you're just going to college, you're spending a lot of money. And if you really don't have a plan or know what you're doing, that's why about 47% of the people drop out. And it's very expensive to go and try that on just to see if that's what you like. So this is helping families really, hopefully, be able to spend their money wisely. Um, to have this opportunity to, to try on the different um, careers to see if this is really what I want to study. And it's a huge increase of the business partnerships as well as just the community college, the four-year schools. People recognize that, that there needs to be a little bit more guidance as far as what students want to study. Well, you can be theory all you want until you try it on. A good example is nursing. People say, well, they want to go want to go do be a nurse. Okay, well, guess what? You're going to be with sick people, you're, you're dealing with blood, you're dealing with needles. Oh, I don't want any part of that. Well, pff, then guess what? Then maybe something else in the medical field could help you or be for you. But it's, it's really um, about helping these, these young, young adults figure out what they want to do at an earlier age before they start spending their parents' money. Um, and so that is critical. With the cost of higher education um, just through the roof, it really helps them make decisions. And like I said, we still have a traditional high school setting. It is wonderful. The um, elective areas help kind of develop those interests in careers. But for those motivated students who want to do something a little bit more, it gives them the opportunity to dive in deeper into their actual career that they think that they want to do. And, and ideally, you want to have two or three different ideas because, as I tell the students, once you get into college that first year, it's 50-50 whether you're going to stay doing what, you're, what you think you want to do, but at least you'll know the process of what type of job do I want, what type of education do I need, is that a growing field, and then you can move on. So those are the skills that they need, and as you can see, our, our students, I feel, are going to be very much prepared for that because I mean, they're 18. They don't know what they want to do for the rest of their lives. I mean, it's just the way it is. And so, but by giving them the oppor these opportunities where they can explore areas of interest, it's certainly going to help on their career choice. Okay. I want to thank everybody up here. I think what you can see here when you talk about the students and you talk about the staff, there's this common thread of choice and ownership of education for that particular student. So thank you all very much for what you do every day for our kids. So hopefully you can kind of see the passion among that group and that, um, you know, I, oftentimes uh, we have this uh, concept that's called uh, uh, nostalgia, which is a combination of nostalgia and amnesia to think that school was and is still is what it was when we experienced it. Um, Yet, yes. most metrics of school performance are higher than they have ever been. Uh, just information coming out uh, earlier this week on the number of students in Missouri passing, uh, taking and passing AP courses. And if you look at how that has changed over the last 10 years, it's just been a phenomenal increase. So we want to uh, wrap up with an administrator panel, and then we'll have time. We'll bring everybody back up, or we can just move microphones around and, and have a question and answer period here at the end. Uh, but to moderate our administrator panel is Dr. Bressel. OK, you see that we have uh, five examples of leaders in our district uh, that have been influential as we uh, have been taking these innovative practices uh, John DeWally, uh, Director of College and Career uh, Readiness. Uh, we have uh, Patrick Bellinger, a middle school principal. Dr. Tina Plummer, um, who is an Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction, Teaching and Learning. Uh, we have Andrea Dean, uh, Principal at Beasley Elementary, and Mr. Clark, Dr. Clark from Mosaic. Uh, we'll start with a question for you, Dr. Clark. Uh, you were an elementary principal in a traditional setting for many years. Uh, recently, you've had a transition as you've uh, had the opportunity to lead the opening of Mosaic Elementary. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, from your perspective, how learning is different in Mosaic? So, um, I, I, the students and the teachers have done a great job 
already explaining what that difference is. And you know, you've heard that really this morning about voice, choice, and kind of shifting from the engagement component to empowerment, where students really take ownership of their learning. One of the biggest differences I think about is when I would go into a classroom in a traditional setting, uh, you know, you ask the student, what are they working on? And they can often answer what they're working on. But often what was missing was the why component and, oh, distraction. <laughs> uh, but the, <laughs> I saw everyone's eyes go. <laughs> but they, the students could answer what they were working on. But often what was missing was why they were working on it and the how component. And when I think of, when I say how, I mean, how is what you're doing now going to change you as a student, as a learner? How does it impact you? How does it impact others around you? And so when I walk into a classroom, to one of our studios at, at Mosaic, our students can answer those three questions. And I think that has shifted the role of the student, them taking ownership of the learning, but also the role of the teacher. And Ms. Bradley did a great job of explaining what, what her role, role is. It's kind of more of a facilitator where you're not just spitting out information to students. Hopefully they take it in and then they get a test at the end of the week, right? In this case, learning is always evolving, always changing, adapting to that student's needs, to their pace of learning, and to really what their interests are. Dr. Clark, how have your leadership style changed? Um, I, so my, I would say my leadership style, this, again, kind of that support system, um, supporting teachers um, in re regards to risk taking, modeling that for them, but also modeling it for students that um, kind of, John DeWally says this, yeah, kind of that, that failing forward, where it's okay to take those risks, it's okay to, um, because through that, there's so much learning opportunities, and I think just being, being that model and supporting and encouraging our teachers to do that, and model it for the students, uh, to, to me that's probably one of the biggest areas I've changed. Great, thank you. Mrs. Dean, um, as a principal of Beasley Elementary, um, a building that does have um, significant uh, student needs, how um, do you work with your staff um, in order to help students uh, with those needs? Well, we do a lot of the same things that you probably see in any good school. Uh, one of the things that we've really focused on is uh, that growth mindset. And I think when people look at a school uh, that maybe has uh, the socioeconomic status that our, some of our students have, um, they think that you're going to change the standards of the curriculum and it's going to be more remedial. And that's not true. Uh, we understand, we've done a lot with brain development, and we're talking about teaching crucial learning skills. And so we really kind of come at it more from an enrichment model and really getting the kids and pushing them. Um, we, have to, we do have to cover some basic things that maybe they don't have coming into school, but then we, they learn and grow from that. Uh, we, just like other schools, we invest in high quality PD. We have very high expectations for our students. We know that all of our students uh, can learn. And we, so we want to make sure that we're following a cognitively challenging curriculum. Um, high student engagement, so just like Mosaic and other schools are really trying to make sure students are engaged and they have a voice and choice, we do those same types of things um, at Beasley. We use a lot of data, ongoing formative assessments, constantly checking in with our students. Um, what we've noticed is our students need a lot of feedback. Um, maybe they are not getting the attention at home, and so they need extra attention and guidance from us. They need more check-ins, they need more reassurance of, hey, I'm, I am doing the right thing. Oh, I did get that right, or oh, I was, I was oh, I can think that way. It's like giving them that reassurance and that trust that they can. Um, it's very, very student-centered. Uh, one of the things at Beasley that we really try to do is support the whole child. And so we have to make sure that their basic needs are met first. So sometimes that's food. Uh, we do universal breakfast right now. Um, we provide snacks to any student that does not have a snack. Uh, we really um, try to do a lot with food, like a food pantry. We uh, run our own food pantry called Hunger Stops Here. We work with area churches uh, to send home backpacks weekly. We send about 20 backpacks home a week right now. Um, but we'll have kids come up to us on a Tuesday and say, I don't have any food tonight. So we go and get a backpack ready right then. It's not just going home on Fridays. Um, sleep, 
Uh, you would think the kids come to school well rested, but that doesn't always happen. So sometimes we have to um, even let kids take a little nap if they need to, because if they're not ready to learn, we can spend all the instructional time um, trying to get them to learn, but we need to make sure that they're um, having good sleep. So we have a lot of conversations with parents, just even about bedtimes, um, how to get their children uh, to go to sleep and have a routine and structure. Um, health, we bring in a dentist several times a year. Uh, we're, uh, for the first time this year, we're also bringing in a vision van. We have a lot of students that, even though we'll help with resources for glasses or other vision needs, they can't, the parents can't get them there. So um, that's uh, something that we work to. Um, we have a washer and dryer at our school that was donated by a parent, and we wash a lot of clothes at our school. We help kids um, if they need clothes, um, those types of things. Um, housing, we've helped parents find housing. We've helped parents fill out applications for housing. Um, we also support our students, of course, like other schools, with a lot of love and belonging. Um, one of the things, too, our students need to feel safe. Sometimes we're their safe place, so we make sure that we do that. Um, also exercise, sometimes our students are living in maybe an apartment complex where they don't get outside as much or in an area where their parents don't want to let them go outside and play as much at times and so we really focus on exercise, um, things like that. Um, our teachers are very accountable, they take a lot of responsibility uh, for the learning. As Amanda talked about, we're very clear with our goals, um, clear direction and focus. Um, one of the big things that we talk about is there's no excuses. You could always go and say, well, this happened or that happened to the students, so this, you know, they're not able to do that. We really focus on what we can change and what's in our control. Um, we foster close relationships with the staff, the peers, peer-to-peer um, -peer relationships, uh, parent relationships. We really have to, um, a lot of times, do home visits, or um, I will offer to go and pick up a parent. I will, we will offer to meet parents at uh, different places in the community. Uh, all of our apartment complexes, I work with them, and they'll say, I, I just call and say, can I have a meeting room today? Because I have a parent that can't get up to school, and they will make sure that we have some place uh, to meet. Uh, we do a lot of mentoring, uh, conflict resolution, where our peers help one another as well. Um, another thing at Beasley is we have a lot of diversity. So we really um, embrace that diversity and we're dedicated to um, helping our students and empowering them, differentiating. Um, we try to do a lot of after school uh, clubs and focus on innovation during the school day and before and after school as well. We want to also incorporate those real life experiences and skills with our students. Um, Ms. Dean, can you talk a little bit about what lawmakers um, should consider to help meet the needs of vulnerable populations like you serve at Beasley? Mm -hmm. So when you're um, serving a population that is almost 60% uh, free reduced lunch with that social, uh, lower socioeconomic uh, status, uh, we experience uh, more emotional and social challenges um, as well as a lot of times uh, students are dealing with chronic stressors. Um, and they're not able to sometimes even explain to us what's wrong. We know something's wrong and they may be acting out, but we don't know what's wrong or what's stressing them. Um, they may have had trauma in their life. Um, some of our students have been in multiple homes, uh, foster care, are uh, living with grandparents or other relatives. Um, we're about 4% homeless at this time um, in our building. Uh, so sometimes you'll see cognitive lags just because students have switched schools. They might not have had quality instruction. Uh, there's lots of health and safety issues. Um, like I said, we might be their safe place. Um, so those kinds of things, um, there's a lot of things that lawmakers can do and consider, um, such as fully funding transportation. Um, you heard me mention that our students don't always have ways to get to school. I have parents who take uh, the Metro bus and they get off at the VA hospital and then walk down to our school. So um, I have a lot of students that need summer school but cannot go to summer school, so even fully funding it during summer school or for after school activities. Um, if, you, if you know, we could fully fund transportation, then our district might be able to pick up some of those extra things. Um, definitely social supports, uh, mental health, social workers, um, you know, no cost therapy. We have uh, students that can't afford therapy but need, need that. Um, like I mentioned before, healthcare, the medical, the dental piece, um, the just access to medicine. We have staff and um, our hunger staff here who at times also donate money for medicines for parents. Um, really that wraparound kind of service for families to help them with whatever they need is important. Um, educating our parents, I would say safety, definitely. Um, 
with guns and drugs and everything we hear on, in our media, um, our kids are affected by that. So definitely looking at safety in our neighborhoods and around our schools. Um, early childhood intervention. I'm a big proponent for early childhood intervention. Those first five years are so important. We get them at age five, and if they haven't had that strong foundation before that, uh, we're playing catch up. So we need that early intervention, that early um, you know, childhood programs and things like that. Um, just increasing instructional resources and those opportunities for our students. Um, our students don't get to go on the type of field trips that maybe other kids get to go on sometimes. And so our parents can afford field trips or the cost of it, so we do a lot of those things to enrich them. Um, funding books in our homes, uh, those types of things would help. Uh, more creativity and drama and physical activities um, available in our neighborhoods. And you heard some of the things as they get older, the shadowing jobs and things like that. Um, those are great ways to help too. Uh, we're really trying to partner with our community. So just opening up doors for those community <coughs> partnerships and for grants and things like that. Um, another thing that I think is so important is not just to measure um, growth and improvement solely based on test scores. Uh, because there's so many things that our students are growing and improving in, and when you just base it on a one-year test score, that doesn't show you the whole picture of a school like Beasley. So I just um, I know that we have the courage and the will to take action, and uh, we will continue to do that and, and work for the students at our school. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Plummer, as a uh, leading expert in professional development, can you talk a little bit about the uh, innovator PD model that uh, Melville School District is currently using? Yes, um, so as you heard from our innovators, which was very exciting to hear the students and the teachers talk about the effect of professional development in our district, we have been very lucky that our community supported an initiative uh, three years ago now that allowed us to increase our professional development funds. And all research tells you in order for there to be an effect in a classroom, you have to have what's called high quality professional development. That means that it has to be ongoing, it has to be sustained, and it has to include not only the professional development, but coaching and support. So the model that we've encountered over the last few years is that we have partnered with Discovery Education, and all of our middle school teachers, every middle school teacher gets three days of training in the summer, and then in addition to that, the middle school teachers could apply to become what was called an innovator. Each middle school has eight innovators, and Hannah spoke of that today. She's one of our innovators. They get three additional days of training, and then they get six days of coaching with a coach from Discovery Education who comes in and works with them. But in addition to that, what she does, that coach, she's in constant contact with those teachers. And I'm sure Hannah could, could say that she agrees with that, and uh, Mr. Salzman and Mr. Bellinger, who both work with the coach as well. It has been a tremendous impact on instruction. I have been in Hannah's room. And what Hannah talked about is what is going on in her room. Her kids are engaged. Her classroom instruction looks different. We heard the kids talk about how their classroom instruction has changed. That is because we've given teachers tools to give them new resources to change that classroom instruction. Because we saw such a positive thing with the STEM program, we now have extended that and we are doing a math innovator program. Every elementary school has a fourth and fifth grade teacher, and every middle school has a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade teacher who are part of that training, and the model is the same, except we're not doing training with all teachers at this point, just innovators. They get training, and they get that coaching and support. And Sarah Bradley, who was up here for Mosaic, is one of those innovators. And what I hear, I actually had a conversation because we had training yesterday. I was talking to Sarah. She said that training is giving her the tools, giving her additional tools to help her in her classroom, and she feels like it has been a positive impact. Great, thank you. Um, this is an opportunity, like Dr. Gaines said, to ask questions of our um, panel, or anyone in the room, actually. Uh, so anybody have questions that they would like to ask? Huh? Uh, I have two questions. First of all, where is Beasley located? OK, uh, we're right off Coke Road. Um, so we sit adjacent to Jefferson Barracks Cemetery and the VA hospital. OK, the other question is, how do students qualify for these programs? Like, for example, Mosaic, are they picked or do they have to apply or how does that work? So uh, the students applied and it was a lottery system. Any student that was eligible to attend a Melville Elementary School could apply to be at Mosaic. And so we had rough, a little less than 600 students applied the first year for 250 spots. 
for other programs, I'll just like for Project Lead the Way, the other programs you heard about, or for the CAPS program, those are app those are classes. So students, once again, it's an application slash they're registering for those courses and they work with their counselors for those things. So to touch back to the mosaic kind of selection process, what we try to do is maintain um, a kind of representative sample of the district. So for example, um, if Beasley represents 8% of our student population, then we want roughly 8% of the students at Mosaic to be from Beasley. Um, so that way we try to let Mosaic mirror the district as much as possible. Other questions? Thank you. Um, again, two questions. Are, are a lot of these innovative learning opportunities available to pretty much every student who, who wants to do that? I know Mosaic is limited, but the other programs within the schools, is that a choice most students get to make? Uh, so uh, at the middle school level, which you know is right in the middle and sort of representative of the whole district, um, they are available. So. Um, Hannah is a, a STEM innovator. We have eight STEM, STEM innovators in our building uh, with three grade levels. So um, one of our STEM, other STEM innovators is our health teacher. And she sees every student in our building every year. She sees half of the students first semester and half second semester. So she's doing these innovative things in her uh, her health class so every uh, Oakville Middle School student um, is uh, is experiencing uh, at least the the stem innovator side of uh, how we're how we're doing a new innovative instruction okay and with this I don't know if I'm using the right terms a non-traditional learning mm -hmm. how does that reconcile with traditional state testing. When you look at research, if students are engaged and if they are problem solving and if they are part of their own learning, test scores are just going to go up. Um, I would say if, if we had a choice of uh, assessing students at the right time on formative pieces would be a much better way to assess students than the way we currently assess kids, which is a one-time test that has changed five times in the last five years. Um, that is a, a moving target. So um, that's why we have continued down the path of if we give our teachers the tools and if we give our students the tools, they're going to perform. And I agree with you that the testing part, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that, and also at Mosaic, we are aligned to our content standards. So yes. um, the, the students are receiving the same um, content, but in terms of instruction and opportunities look different. I would also like to state come to your first question about how, you know, how many students have the opportunity to be, to experience this learning. Um, so obviously when we were coming in and developing Mosaic, one of the things we talked about was Mosaic would be kind of an internal professional development opportunity for all of our staff, uh, not only Mosaic but throughout Melville. So, so far we've had a majority of the elementary schools come to visit Mosaic and even small pieces that they can take back to their classrooms. So um, it's kind of that spark, that's what we talked about. And hopefully even some of the small things can be taken from Mosaic, brought back into the classroom. And even before Mosaic was established, there were already teachers in the district who were champions for this innovation, innovative approach, and they were embedding some of those practices in their classrooms. So we're seeing that just continue to grow, which is really, really exciting. And how do we change the culture of the testing cycle and patterns that we're so frustrated with right now? Any ideas how we get to DESE to, to change that? I'll address that one somewhat. <laughs> it's like, who's going to jump well, in first? You were making as, as Dr. Plummer said, you know, what, what we would advocate for is right test, right time. Um, the challenge with that is that the feds require grade level testing. The question then becomes, what is a grade level? And historically, grade level has been really established and framed around age, not ability, and not knowledge and the, or uh, 
just performance, right? So if you have more than one child, you know that they don't develop at the same rate. They don't walk at the same time. They don't talk at the same time. Yet, we expect all third graders who vary greatly in age to jump over the exact same bar at the exact same time, where we could have a year's plus difference. And while a year may not be a lot of difference for people who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, when you're eight, a year is a lot. And there's a lot of development that takes place within a year. So what we would advocate for is the notion of, you know what, maybe that midway through my third grade year, I'm ready for the, to take the third grade ELA test. But maybe I'm not ready for that math test until April, or maybe the end of February. So how can we have flexibility in that? Especially as some schools are trying to reimagine not even having grade levels, but having learning levels, that we just move kids along a continuum of learning. And when they're ready to take an assessment, we move them on. One of the things uh, that we see kind of across the country, um, Arizona moved to what they call move on when ready. It's a high school initiative. And at the end of their sophomore year of high school, students can take an exam. And if they pass that exam, they are awarded a state diploma. And then they can enter Grand Canyon University in their junior year and start college right then. So if a student shows that they're ready to move on, they pass a test, they get a diploma, and they move on to the next level. So sometimes our systems, because of when we were created and how education has evolved, you know, really originating from this almost industrial manufacturer, we move kids along at grade levels at a certain time, you know, a lot of what we're trying to do is to break free from that and get the flexibility to move away from that. But we still do have those constraints around state assessment, which is largely driven by um, being in compliance with the federal. So if we could break out of that, uh, I, we think we could be a lot more interesting and probably be able to do more stuff than we already can. Uh, but what we've tried to do is when we started a lot of these pieces, uh, we met with our Desi State Supervisor and said, here are the things that we're thinking about doing, and we think that we can do these because it's allowable through this, 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 and this. So tell us if we're wrong. They're like, no, you can do all those things. And then the question becomes, okay, we're going to do all this stuff, but we have to submit this information to the state. Help us to submit it in a way that we're not going to get kickbacks and grief about that. So uh, for us, the way we've kind of approached that, uh, DESI has been helpful in allowing us to do these kinds of things. Uh, and we would, you know, we've got, you know, Sabrina talked about my path. We had others talk about my path. We talked about CAPS. We would love and we anticipate that we'll see growth in those programs. I mean, interest in my path for next year is already probably triple what it is this year. And for CAPS, our interest, especially in the biomedical part of CAPS, far exceeds our capacity. Um, so our CAPS program on the biomedical side um, our partner is St. Anthony's. St. Anthony's actually provides a full-time nurse to help facilitate the CAPS program. But we've got a waiting list of kids to get in because we just don't have the business partners to accommodate the number of students that we have. 
Um, so we're very grateful for the business partners that we have. And not only do we have business partners, I mean, we have partners like the Fire Protection District, who's over here using the pool for training, right? Uh, we also do other training with them on buses and, and, and stuff and how to handle turnover vehicles. Uh, so we've got lots and lots of partners uh, who help us deliver quality instruction to our kids or you know, help with training and a, and a number of things, but we can always use more. You know, that, that's, a, that's a piece. So, you know, if we think about um, how could, you know, from a policy standpoint, are there policies at the state level that could provide incentive for businesses to partner with local schools? You know, so sorry that was a long answer. <laughs> uh, other questions? All right, now I want to be respectful of everyone's uh, time. We certainly want to thank uh, Representative Hafner, Hafner, Representative Barnes, and then representatives uh, from Congressman Wagner's office and from Senator McCaskill's office for coming to be here with us today. We know everybody has a busy schedule, but I think uh, what we were able to do is really showcase our kids and the good work that our teachers are doing, not only up here, but back there with Mrs. Clark and her ProStar kids. Thank them for uh, providing breakfast. And if you ever want to get in to see what's happening in any of these schools and classrooms, feel free to contact our principals directly or contact our office, and we can uh, certainly set that up. But we, we're very proud of the things that we've got going on here, and it's really because of the people that we have in front of students each and every day and the work that they do. I've been fortunate to work in a number of districts, and one of the things that I always say are there are good people everywhere, um, and we've got some great folks here, and they are pushing themselves and always taking risks to provide the best learning opportunities for the students that we serve. So thank you all very much, and have a good rest of your day. Thanks.